Okay, um, I'd like to get started. Uh, my name is Rob Atkinson. I'm president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And we're really pleased to uh, roll out this re report today, uh, this joint report with my colleague and friend Mark Muro from the Brookings Institution uh, about how to bring more tech jobs and more tech activity to other parts of the country. And we're going to drill down into exactly why we're making that case and the specific, the specific case and policy we're recommending. But we're really uh, pleased and honored that the Senate Competitiveness Caucus has hosted us today. And uh, so I want to turn it over to uh, the co-chairs. But first, uh, uh, Senator Chris Coons, who is the co-chair of the Senate Competitiveness Caucus, uh, he, uh, he, he founded that with Senator Moran uh, from Kansas. Uh, he's also, Senator Coons is the Vice Chair of the Senate Ethics Committee. He's on Appropriations, Foreign Relations, Judiciary, and Small Business and Entrepreneurship. He is also on the Congressional High Tech Caucus, the Manufacturing Caucus, and many others. Uh, but I think his most important uh, claim to fame is that he is the Honorary Co-Chair of ITIF's board. So please join me in welcoming Senator Coons. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thanks uh, to all of you for giving me a, uh, a brief, bipartisan, encouraging respite from an <laughs> interminable hearing that I am currently enjoying. Uh, the Judiciary Committee began at 10 a.m. this morning, and if it concludes by 3, I will be delighted. And while I understand that oversight is an important part of our role, um, it is just a sharply divided partisan exercise. This is the opposite, and so that's all I'm saying is that it's uh, delightful uh, to have a chance uh, to join again with my dear friend and colleague, Senator Moran of Kansas, in looking at what are the things we should be doing um, to strengthen our economy and our society, um, and as the caucus title suggests, to make us more competitive globally. Um, we have focused on um, some core issues like research and development, advanced manufacturing, infrastructure, uh, workforce training, um, and this report hits on all of those notes. And since he wasn't here to hear me say it, <laughs> I'm going to say it again. It is a delight and a joy and an honor uh, to be joined by my co-chair, uh, Jerry Moran of Kansas, uh, who has made um, serving here. It is a delight to be joined by my friend and co-chair, Jerry Moran of Kansas, uh, who continues to make service here um, not just uh, something I endure, but something I enjoy. So, Jerry, thank you again for being um, a great co-chair. Um, I was talking uh, briefly about what the Competitiveness Caucus has focused on and how the report um, that is the principal focus today um, touches on all of these uh, issues. Briefly, um, one statistic from this report on tech hubs across the country is uh, particularly stunning. Between San Diego, Seattle, the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, and Boston, um, that accounts for 90 percent, just those four geographic areas, 90 percent of our nation's innovation sector growth um, from 2005 to 2017. Um, and as uh, senators who are from some areas that are not among those four areas, I think our principal question is, how do we get some of that? Um, concentration of investment and innovation in just a few technology hubs um, is a market failure and bad for the vast majority of the American people. Americans outside of the highest performing, uh, highest concentration tech hubs um, have less opportunity. Um, and those who are living in uh, and around these uh, tech hubs, uh, frankly, are worse off because uh, they have um, less of a affordable housing accessible to them. They have some of the worst commutes in the country. Um, while they may have a lot of opportunity, uh, day in and day out, um, the experience of living in incredibly concentrated high growth tech hubs isn't always pleasant. I'm tempted to ask for a show of hands of how many of you enjoy your daily commute here in Washington, I suspect um, I won't be overwhelmed with um, highly raised hands. You enjoy your daily commute. I'm in the northeast uh, D.C. In northeast D.C. What am I whining about? I don't know. <laughs> I'm the idiot who commutes from Delaware, right? I mean, I mean <laughs> by choice. Um, I do also believe that when companies focus on just a few um, highly concentrated tech hubs, they're missing out. Uh, because genius is evenly distributed across the uh, human population and across our nation. Um, and instead of requiring folks to move to these few um, concentrated hubs, our hope is to distribute some of this opportunity across the country. Um, Wilmington, I would argue, uh, which has a long tradition of manufacturing and of industry and of innovation, um, has a great deal of opportunity, and we'd like to do things to make 
um, access to credit, uh, access to investment, access to capital, and access to a high-skilled workforce uh, a reality. Um, there are several ways in which Rob and Mark's uh, detailed proposals in this report, um, spreading tech hubs to more of America, um, would build upon our bipartisan work in the Competitiveness Caucus. Um, two of the bills uh, that we've been working on are poised to become law. Uh, in this year's uh, Defense Authorization Act. Uh, the Global Leadership and Advanced Manufacturing Act is paired in the NDAA with Senator Moran's bill to reauthorize and expand uh, the highly effective regional innovation program. And as this report makes clear, um, there's other areas of federal policy that can help um, to spread opportunity um, and high-tech jobs more evenly. Uh, one that I'm excited to work on in the near future, hopefully with Senator Moran, is access to capital. Uh, I will be introducing a bill soon with colleagues to establish a federal-state partnership to spread venture capital, not just geographically, but also to a more um, diverse group of entrepreneurs. I'm also a believer in the importance of the R&D tax credit um, in the years since we've made it permanent, I think it has become a more powerful tool, um, and I think we can uh, do things to make it a smarter uh, and more effective investment in attracting human uh, private capital. Uh, an idea that I'm interested in in this report is a human capital tax credit uh, to encourage more robust uh, investment in the high-tech workforce. So um, this is an exciting uh, proposal. Uh, it addresses several related problems at once. Um, targeted investment in the most promising regions can spark lasting change, not just for local economies, but for our competitiveness as a nation. Um, so if you're here because uh, you're interested in policy or you're a policymaker, get your pencils out. I've heard these guys um, speak many times, and they know their business, and I know you will hear a remarkable roadmap for strengthening our nation and its competitiveness. Let me close by saying what a joy and a delight it is to be joined by my Competitiveness Caucus co-chair, Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas. Senator, I haven't introduced you. Oh, all right. I thought do. that was what Chris was doing. Well, you have to be introduced twice, I think. Uh, I'm fine uh, with that. So uh, formally, I should introduce you. Senator Moran, uh, obviously a senator from Kansas, uh, uh, first uh, elected in 2010. Uh, obviously co-chair and founder, co-founder of the Competitiveness Caucus. But I have to say, in our view, competitiveness is probably the single most important economic policy issue facing the country. So thank you, both of you, for doing that. Uh, Senator Moran serves on appropriations, uh, banking, commerce, science, and transportation, Indian affairs, and veterans affairs, uh, also on the uh, Senate Aerospace uh, and NIH caucuses. So thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for the attendance here today. Uh, your report uh, has obviously uh, captured people's attention. Uh, we were uh, perceptive enough to uh, plan this uh, competitive caucus, <laughs> caucus right. uh, in advance of the report, uh, not knowing exactly what you'd say, but uh, this was perfect timing from my perspective. And uh, it is, let me just speak for a moment. First of all, I need to say something nice about Chris, maybe three or four times, uh, and I would, I would do that. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I knew you would wait. Um, it is, I would say this with all sincerity, it is so much of a pleasure to work with Chris, both as someone who knows policy, is committed to policy, but somebody who just genuinely is a nice and gracious person and, and shares my view that one of the best things we could do to the United States Congress, the United States Senate, and for the American people is actually have a United States Senate and a United States Congress that works, uh, accomplishes things. Uh, it's nice sometimes to be applauded for our efforts but I would much prefer to be applauded for our successes, for the results that those efforts are designed to attain. And uh, anytime you can find colleagues who are interested in results as compared to, to uh, headlines, uh, incidentally headlines, many of us wish we could figure out how to be in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post within a matter of two days uh, and not say something on Twitter or be convicted of a crime. Uh, you, you've accomplished a lot uh, of next. attention. That's next, uh, all right. Um, my, just a personal, on a personal level, I want to accomplish something for my state, and yes, perhaps it's related to being a member of, of Congress, of the United States Senate, but just a desire, as, as our state is a manufacturing place, we manufacture lots of airplanes, uh, agricultural equipment, we manufacture, we're an ag state, we produce lots of commodities that uh, are important to, to, the, to us as in, a, in a global economy. We are an energy state, producing lots of energy. We become a, a part of, and we think of that as oil and gas, and that's true, but we become a wind producer. 
We have lots of basic components of an economy, but my personal goal is to do everything I can to see that there is an additional component to our state's economy, and that is related to STEM. That that is uh, students, uh, individuals, Kansas citizens, and others who would come to Kansas would find a place where not only we educate young men and women in science, mathematics, engineering, and research, but we have careers that then follow that opportunity. Uh, and those things, this report indicates, despite our efforts, are not happening to the degree that they are happening elsewhere. That if you start off well in this arena, you have a much better chance of continuing to grow than if you are starting off someplace less than that and trying to grow. And so what I also appreciate about this report is that it not only highlights the challenge, the problem, which is what many times we hear in, in mm -hmm. discourse with our constituents, they tell us what is wrong. It is useful to have someone who tells us what is the roadmap that might make what is wrong right. And so this is a value to me. It's, uh, uh, again, a very personal goal on my part to try to change the nature of at least a component of our state's economy. So I'm, I'm very grateful to them for the, their work and for their presence with us today. And uh, I look forward to following up with you. I'd like to spend uh, and, and give my, our colleagues some additional time to spend time with you to see if we can generate a, additional support. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things that I, I think are good news. Um, I, I mentioned the importance of a STEM workforce. We have lots of places in Kansas that we think uh, present those opportunities. But we, as a state, we as a country need to develop a highly skilled labor pool. In my time uh, in public service, I've seen so many instances in which our attempts to recruit business and industry re revolve about infrastructure, not unimportant. But it is uh, an investment in plant and equipment. And while that remains important, the, the inducement to get somebody to come or to stay my view is it is the workforce. So we ought to be investing in people uh, to a much higher degree than we invest in buildings. Uh, and a property tax abatement might be valuable in, 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 in that final thing that brings a business to us or retains a business to us. But in my view, it's not the thing that makes the difference. It, it may make a difference, but it, it's not the compelling thing that gets somebody's attention. I've always believed if you have the best educated, highly trained workforce, businesses will find you. It is the greatest challenge we face in business today, uh, and that involves competitiveness in a global economy, is the workforce that uh, is skilled and motivated uh, to do great things. We've, we've worked hard in a number of instances, but particularly with Wichita State University in the aerospace industry. Again, one of those cities that's sometimes mentioned in your report and mentioned in the press reports as a place that uh, has potential but not to the degree that the five locations uh, that are, are succeeding so well have. And so a partnership between Wichita State University and the aerospace industry is something that is, we think, changing the nature of that community. And it involves research and education of students, internships, and we want to make certain that that education then is utilized in the, in the industries that we have in our state and to bring others in. Um, so I also would point out that one of the things that we're working on, we've been successful as Republicans and Democrats in the Congress in increasing the significant amount of dollars available for research at NIH, the National Institute of Health, but there are so many additional research entities that could use that kind of boost. The one I'm most focused on is NSF. Uh, I chair the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds NSF. And uh, we want to make certain that we also share in that increasing commitment toward basic and applied research that can help change the world. Right. So uh, NSF is, is uh, receiving, if we ever, next week when we have the appropriation bill on the floor, uh, you'll see what we were able to do to improve uh, NSF. And our own bill, the, the House, uh, I'm sorry, the Senate bill that uh, is public, uh, we were successful in a $242 million increase in NSF funding uh, for FY20. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. I knew there was an applause line for at least one person uh, in the room. Um, the report discusses the need to empower people from, over the from all over the world to work in America by reforming our, H1, uh, our H-1B and other necessary visa programs. 
Uh, Senator Coons and I, but uh, Senator Warner and I in, in particular, have been long engaged in something called the Startup Act, uh, for which we're now on about version number four or five. It is a challenge because it involves immigration policy, which makes it very difficult as a package to accomplish a wide array of things, but to encourage entrepreneurial visas, to encourage STEM visas, increase the, the, the uh, folks uh, who find America the place in which they can pursue the American dream, and in the process of that American dream put other, other people, particularly Americans, to work. Um, the Kaufman Foundation, um, Mr. Kaufman used to own the, the Royals. Uh, when upon his death, he left his money to a foundation that promotes entrepreneurship, uh, and their findings uh, indicate that 39% of uh, PhDs are a result of temporary visas, meaning that we get talent and skills. We certainly need to educate our own, but the number of engineers and others that we need in our country's economy, uh, it will not be fulfilled in the short term by simply looking internally. So we need to increase the number of folks in a STEM education, something I think we all know. Um, we, the Startup Act, if, uh, if your members, if your senators uh, have any interest in our efforts to, to, to jumpstart innovation, please take a look at that legislation. Senator uh, Warner on the Democrat side and me on the Republican side uh, are working to try to make certain we advance a cause of entrepreneurship. Um, I also would finally conclude uh, a, a, with a, to, to, to express my pleasure that uh, the Economic Development Administration, EDA's Regional Innovation Strategic Program, uh, is something that Chris mentioned. Uh, our CGS bill in the Senate, and it again increases another $31 million uh, provides $31 million for that program, and it's an increase of $7.5 million from last year's level. So just a couple of things that, uh, in this appropriations process, and, we, and Chris mentioned a couple of things that are happening uh, as we speak at NDAA. So my, my effort was to demonstrate that we care about this issue. We know a little bit. We care about it this much. We know some. And uh, what we can learn from these two individuals is of great value to me, and I hope to all of you, and we're grateful for your attention and, and interest in this topic. And I thank my staff for their efforts uh, in putting this uh, conference together. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. And Chris, is a, Chris is a really good guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Senator Moran, and, and also for Senator Coons for joining us. And uh, really applaud your leadership on that. And some, some real wins, by the way, in the last uh, in the NDAA that we can hopefully build upon as we go forward next year. So I want to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Mark Muro. Mark is a senior fellow and policy director at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. Uh, Mark's done really outstanding, as that, that overall program has done, outstanding work highlighting the importance of metro areas and innovation. And uh, this is just one uh, other result of that. So Mark, take it away. Great, how's everybody? Great, thanks, thanks so much uh, uh, for coming. And, Thank you so much for Senator Soon, Coons uh, and Moran for convening us. Thanks to all of you uh, coming out to talk about an important uh, topic today. Regional divides, I would argue, are one of the most important ch challenges the nation faces right now. And it's great that so many of you are here uh, uh, and concerned about that. So I'm, I'm Mark Muro, Senior Fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Program. Uh, my work focuses and has for quite a while now on the interplay of people, technology, and place. How do those things come together? Uh, Rob Atkinson uh, and I want to dig into a particularly challenging aspect of the nation's regional divides, how technology is exacerbating divides that may have been underway in any event. Equally important, we want to suggest how we need as a country to aggressively deploy federal resources to counter this uh, uh, division. Uh, and, and I want to note one other thing. We do think that if we do some of the things that we talk about here, we'll not only begin to knit the country back together again, but that we'll also improve its competitiveness, uh, not least in the competition with China, which Rob is going to talk about a little bit. Um, so what I want to do is initially frame the problem here uh, and why it matters, drawing on this you know, brand new uh, paper that Rob and I have written. Uh, uh, I, I will try to be concise, and then Rob is going to take over and brief you on our proposed response, which we think is 
not the sum total of what the nation needs to do to counter these challenges, but this, is, this might be the right starting point. So let's talk about what's happening first. Uh, at the broadest level, you know, it's been obvious forever that you know, cities and regions perform at different levels given their different starting attributes, whether geography or resources or size. One only has to think about you know, the nation's varied topography and geography and the contrasts of big cities like New York and smaller ones, faster growing cities and slower growing cities. We assume a degree of variation, right? We, we've internalized that. And yet, in recent years, it's become clear that something new and disturbing is happening. Uh, most notably, an epidemic of what we call regional divergence has become unmistakable, visible at every scale, and as the economic fortunes of high-tech superstar cities like Boston and San Francisco have pulled away, the fortunes of dozens of secondary metropolitan areas like Kansas City or Indianapolis uh, are going sideways. Uh, they are growing uh, arithmetically, adding tech jobs, but as you're going to see, actually losing share. While hundreds of other often smaller uh, towns and rural areas are left farther behind in real distress. So we have a whole continuum of, you know, we think geography-related problems uh, in the country expressing themselves at every uh, scale. Now, uh, you know, here, let's look at this in terms of time or time frame. Rather than growing together as they used to, the nation's regions, metropolitan areas, and towns have been growing apart in a specific, trackable, mappable way. This isn't, uh, you know, a kind of subjective commentary. You know, this is, you know, these are statistical trends. And here you can see this. For much of the 20th century, the last century, uh, well-recognized, welfare-maximizing market forces tended to reduce wage investment and business formation disparities between more and less developed uh, uh, regions. By narrowing divides, the economy ensured a welcome convergence among communities and regions. It's, it's astonishing to think that 50 years ago, the South was catching up with the rest of the country. And as a country, we assumed that poorer places were getting richer and catching up. And in fact, that was indeed largely the truth. Uh, uh, however, in the 1980s, the trend began to break down. As I believe, uh, and I think Rob believes, that digital technologies and innovation removed moved to the center of economic activity. Now, this brought tremendous gains to the country. Intense new demands for talent and insights in, in, increased the value of agglomeration economies, unleashing self-reinforcing and, uh, 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 and, and innovation dynamics that increasingly benefited a short list of big coastal core regions that had begun growing in this specifically technological way early and began to pull away from cities and metro areas and other parts of the country. Amid these conditions, as you can see here, convergence trend gave way to divergence. And you see in the, that blue line, that's the top 20 or so metropolitan areas begin to look differently and behave differently from the rest of the country. And you can see uh, areas like Boston, the Bay Area, Seattle begin to consistently outperform less tech-based places on measures of high quality economic performance, like, like wages and income, uh, which is what we're showing here. Uh, now, in no domain, what's more of these trends been starker than in the innovation sector. A portfolio of 13 of the nation's most essential R&D and STEM worker intensive industries that we looked at in our new paper. Uh, uh, this, this builds on work that my team and uh, Jacob Witten at Brookings, who's here, uh, developed in a broader way, identifying advanced industries that had high R&D and high STEM. Here we have tightened uh, those cutoffs to get to the truly heart of the heart of the nation's strategic, most important industries, to get the very creative pieces of the, techno of the technology and innovation game. And here you can see um, you know, how, uh, how intense the, uh, the, these dynamics are. The top 20, again, the blue line, or 5% of metros, 
for innovation industry growth have far outstripped the next 20 places, the orange line, and then the next 60, uh, and, and then the bottom 75% of places. So there are these almost fractal trajectories for places given their presence in these very intense uh, and important uh, uh, industries. And the result is a crisis, we, would, we are saying, of regional imbalance. We're somewhat breaking the glass with this report and saying, folks, we have an emergency of spatial divergence underway. And it's here, uh, the, the, these dynamics are epitomized by trends in the innovation sector. In, uh, in, in, and you can see here, looking at the map, you can see far more red dots depicting metro area losses of local share of the national innovation sector. So many of these places may be adding a few tech jobs a few innovation sector jobs, but they're actually losing share to uh, the core of the in innovation industry. And, and here you can see far from diffusing, we're seeing a concentration in that very short list that the senators alluded to. Just five top innovation metros, Boston, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, and San Diego, accounted for 90% of the nation's innovation sector growth between 2005 and 2017. So you can see those coastal bright blue hubs that are sizable, and, but are actually you know, controlling uh, and, and increasing their share of this you know, definition of our uh, uh, innovation sector. And it hasn't just been share loss. Uh, it's true, most places are adding a few jobs but losing share, but nearly 200 metropolitan areas, about half of them actually, are shedding innovation jobs. They actually, not just have lost share, but have actually have a smaller innovation sector than they did uh, in 2005. So we think that that is extremely concerning. Uh, the innovation game, which resides at the center of the economic game, has taken on a very pronounced winner-take-most dynamic, where the strong are getting stronger, and almost everywhere else is either going sideways or actually losing participation, losing share. Um, and this is likely coloring U.S. growth patterns and much else. So, which brings me to, uh, uh, before I hand the uh, baton over to Rob, I uh, just want to touch on some reasons why this matters. Now, Let's, let's be clear, this could be fine. This might be fine. And in fact, some economists argue that the current hyper-concentrated winner-take-most geography really is the optimal market-ordained geographical configuration for maximized innovation. I would say actually that that is something of uh, a conventional wisdom. You can't alter this because this is what the tech industry wants. This is what the uh, innovation activity wants. The presence of clustering is widely recognized. It's a focal point of regional and national prosperity. So maybe that's true, but uh, we think there's increased, we are certainly very concerned, there's increased concern among scholars, policymakers, and business people that the nation's geographical polar polarization is now throwing off untenable economic, social, and political costs. I'm just gonna tick off a few of these. At the economic end of the equation, the costs of excessive tech concentration are creating serious negative externalities. For the superstar hubs, we've read about this constantly, the side effects range from spiraling home prices, traffic gridlock, high business costs that are sending work and investment offshore, giving, uh, given the shortage of vibrant low-cost centers, and frequently that work is winding up abroad. Uh, and, and broadly, an ugly sorting of workers is occurring that sends college-educated workers into the star cities. They are mobile, while leaving most metros to make do with thinner talent reserves. That is a recognized, increasingly recognized, uh, uh, serious market failure in new economic literature. Um, so, Given that, whole portions of the nation may be falling into traps of underdevelopment where they actually can't catch up for, or for reasons of human capital and other. 
Equally concerning is the fact that the nation's regional divergence is unfair in social terms. Very starkly, millions of citizens are being seriously disadvantaged with respect to job opportunities, income possibilities, mental health outcomes, simply by living in one region rather than another. That seems to us a very serious uh, problem. Uh, where people live is a huge determinant of their economic opportunities, and so the nation's hyper-concentrated economic geography is a kind of exclusion, a very serious challenge. And then finally, I think the elephant in the room here is political side effects of these dynamics. To be sure, there are a lot of debates about whether cultural or economic dynamics are driving our nation's political divides. But I, nonetheless, I think numerous scholars have long stressed the influence of economic trends on political behavior. And there's a lot of evidence that our current political discontent owes at least in part to a revolt of the places left behind. And that should matter for the competitiveness caucus for certain. If more voters begin to feel they are not benefiting from the innovation economy, that is likely going to make that, that's going to make them less likely to support measures to foster it, such as increased federal support for scientific research or STEM education, really the list of things that the senators mentioned. Those might become more distant possibilities if most of the country feels somehow at a remove from this uh, innovation uh, dynamism that we're talking about. So that's a problem too. And so with that, I want to turn this over to Robert Atkinson, who is going to review why then federal action is necessary. Let's, ar let's argue that. We're not just going to assert it. We're going to ar we say why we argue it and why one might big move might, what one big move might look like. So, Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Okay. 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 Um, So I want to sort of bring two issues to the fore about why, why we need to do something about this. And when you listen to some conventional economists who, frankly, have never studied regional economics, there's actually a discipline of economics called regional economics, which I studied a lot when I got my doctorate. Uh, most economists haven't studied that. And so they have this view of the world that uh, there is this notion of convergence, as Mark talked about. Why are these companies so dumb that they're putting all of their efforts into these high-cost places? Why don't they move to Topeka? It costs less. Hmm. Well, there's two problems with that view. One is innovation industries, advanced R&D industries, compete largely on innovation. They're not competing on cost. They're not widget industries where if you can bring the price down by 4%, you're going to get more sales. If they don't develop the next thing for their business, they're out of business. So they're willing to take high costs as part of doing business. So they're not going to go to some place that just has low costs. They're going to only go to places that have the dynamics that they need in this innovation ecosystem or this cluster. So what do they do? Uh, in this report, in this research project, we ended up talking to a number of Silicon Venture capitalists and other kinds of folks doing this, not just at Silicon Valley. And the consistent story we got was there is no way we're going to put our venture money into a firm that is not in one of these hubs. That's just not going to happen. But what we do is we work on that firm. We give them 5 or $10 million. We build up the firm to maybe 30 or 40 or 50 people. And then we say, okay, you're expanding. You need to think about going to Shenzhen in China or Bangalore in India or Taipei or Tel Aviv or even Vancouver. We don't want you to put the rest of your facility in Silicon Valley. It's too expensive. So why do they go there? Why would they put their, their or in Manila, why do they put their things there and not in Indianapolis? Um, one of the interesting things when we did the studies, we compared the cost of places like uh, Tel Aviv and Boston, or, Shen or Shanghai and uh, Seattle, uh, Detroit and other places, uh, sorry, uh, and what you find is that the cost of a place like Detroit or Indianapolis or Pittsburgh is actually now cost competitive with these other foreign global hubs. So these companies could move their next 50, 100, 
500 jobs to a domestic hub and not lose any cost competitiveness. So this is not the old model in our mind of, well, they're going offshore to cut costs. There's nothing we can do about it. We don't want to be the low cost producer. No, what's going on is they're going offshore to cut costs, but only from the costs that are super high, for Boston, Seattle, Silicon Valley costs, okay? So that's point number one. Point number two is, well, why don't they just go there now? And the way to understand that is to understand the Amazon HQ2 decision. So Amazon wanted to put second headquarters. They did this, you know, bid, whatever. And there were lots of places in the heartland that bid and had very good and very strong bids. But Amazon chose New York and Washington, D.C. Why? Because there's an old saying, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. No location decision consultant ever got fired by suggesting you go to Washington, D.C. You don't, you don't lose. Because if you go to Washington, D.C., you can be assured of a great workforce. Lots, I mean, lots of people out of college, they move to D.C. or they move to New York. Great airport hubs, suppliers, good universities. It's a safe bet. Now, if Amazon instead said, we want to go to Columbus, what are they really betting on? What they're betting on is that we are not going to be the only one out there on our own. We will go to a place like Columbus, but we want to make sure that 10 other companies also go to Columbus or St. Louis or Birmingham or Nashville or whatever those places might be. So the second key point is you have a coordination failure. What could be rational for an individual firm only becomes rational for that firm if a bunch of firms all act together. And we've heard that from companies. They're like, there is simply no way we can risk going to a place like that. Part of that reason is also this uh, view, this change in the labor market. Uh, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, the labor market was largely the man had the job and the woman's spouse followed behind. Now what we have predominantly, are two, at least for knowledge workers, colleges, you have two professionals, and both of them are making that decision jointly. And while, let's just say, one of the professionals is a computer scientist and gets a great job in Indianapolis, or again, or Columbus, or wherever it might be, the spouse might not want to go there because the employment opportunities are not rich enough. So again, the safe bet for a two-earner, two-profession, college-educated couple is, Let's go to Seattle. I can work at Amazon. You can work at Target or whatever, not Target, uh, Nordstrom or <laughs> Boeing or whatever it might be. So that suggests that just leaving it up to the market uh, is, is not going to do this. So this notion that there's going to be natural convergence is wrong. To the extent there is natural convergence, it is convergence between Shanghai and Silicon Valley or Bangalore in Boston. That's the convergence that's happening now. Now, if, we, if we're all globalists and we don't care about the country, sure, this is cool. We love convergence. But we're all Americans, and so I think what we should care about, and certainly what the people who work in this building should care about, is about convergence within the United States. Okay, uh, I mentioned that. So, all right, so what are we doing today, and what's, what, why do we need to change it? What we're doing today is essentially what I would call a bottom-up peanut butter approach. So pretty much every single place in the country has their own technology development program. They've got entrepreneurship programs. They've got STEM education programs. They've got tech transfer programs. They've got venture capital programs. You name it. There is no lack or dearth of innovative, interesting bottom-up efforts. I'm on the board of, of the State Science and Technology Institute, which is a group of all the state technology develop, economic development folks. I've been involved in this for many, many years. It's not that this is bad or ineffective. Those programs are good. They generally work well. They just haven't gotten critical mass. They can't scale because no state or even metro is big enough to move the needle. And I think the way to think about this is what we need to do is we need to find a way to get a few places into what some people call escape velocity. So Silicon Valley is already has escape velocity. They're just on autopilot, man. They just keep going. They get more money, more people come. They get more money, more people come. Uh, other places are working, working. They're somewhat first step back, step, another step forward. So we need to have a big federal push to get escape velocity for a few places. And that is going to require top-down intervention. 
It's going to require the federal government to play an important, significant role in partnership with a set of regions. And so uh, that's really what we're focusing. Now, the other really key question here is why just focus on a few places? You know, we lay out, I don't know how many places, 35, 40. There, there could be more. I mean, it's not set in stone, but there aren't 200. And, and as much as it pains Mark and I to say this, there are just certain places that it doesn't make any difference what you do. They will never be a tech hub. I remember when I was getting my PhD in Chapel Hill in the state of North Carolina, really, really wanted tech jobs uh, in eastern North Carolina. I don't know if anybody's ever been to eastern North Carolina. It just cannot be done. It just cannot be done. Doesn't matter what you do. If you want tech jobs in North Carolina, they're going to be in Winston-Salem, Charlotte, may, maybe Asheville, and certainly Research Triangle Park. So there's only a certain number of places. What do those places all have in common? Number one, probably some reasonably good research university. Doesn't have to be at the top, but tech companies like to be near a research university. It needs to have some reasonable pool of technology workers. It needs to have some reasonably good pool of technology companies, both big, medium, and small, and probably needs some reasonably good airport connection. Um, there's a great joke, or not great joke, big saying by venture capitalists, I will invest anywhere where we can have a two-hour direct flight. <laughs> but if it's a connection, we're not going there. So that, by definition, just means that there's going to be a smaller set of places. The advantage of doing that, though, is if we can concentrate a set of resources on a modest set of places, we believe that they can get escape velocity. And in a program where the federal government would say, we're going to do a competition, which I'll talk about in a moment, for a small set of places, 8, 10, 12 places, uh, and focus only on them for a 10-year period. After that, if you don't make it, it's too bad. But if, after 10 years, you've you got to be able to make it. So what does that package look like? What we're suggesting is that package should look like a, a package of direct and indirect supports, the most important being research support. Uh, if you look at research universities in the real successful tech hubs, they average about 2 to $2.2 billion a year in federal, R, federal research support. So think about MIT or Stanford or University of Washington, about $2.2 billion. If you look at the second hubs, second tier hubs we're looking at, they average about 800 million, maybe a billion. So if you think about ramping up over a few years an extra billion dollars a year into these research universities in these tech hubs, pr promising tech hubs, we think that would send an important signal, both in terms of talent production as well as sending a signal to companies that want to be near that innovation and uh, learning ecosystem. Uh, certainly workforce training funding with community colleges and other kinds of programs. A set of tax preferences. So, for example, we propose that there be a, a special collaborative R&D tax credit. If you locate in these areas and you work with a university there, you would get a special tax preference. Uh, we also propose, for example, as Senator Coons talked about this, H-1B visas. Everybody, all the companies, they all hit the cap. I think it's 65,000 now. Uh, what we're proposing is allocating another 30,000 H-1B visas annually, but only for companies that are in these winning hubs. So if you're in these winning hubs, you now get some visa. I think that would be a very powerful tool to uh, get companies uh, to think about that. Uh, certainly business financing, uh, other kinds of federal uh, policies, including federal properties, federal jobs, and the like. But the last I'll just mention is antitrust exemption. What I mean by that is if we could allow companies to formally collaborate, so you could imagine the top 20 advanced technology companies in the world, the Microsofts, the Boeing, the Intels, the HPs, the Googles, and they could get together once a year and say, okay, we're all going to work on when we're expanding those next jobs, we're going to all agree that we're going to commit to these eight to ten places. Now, they might be able to do it under antitrust rules today, but we want to make sure that they could do it. This would be similar to what Congress did in 1984 with they passed the collaborative R&D collaborative antitrust exemption, which allows firms to get together to do pre-competitive R&D. But again, if we could get firms to be able to collaborate, plus a signal from the federal government that says, if you're going to locate in one of these places, a uh, Kansas City or uh, Birmingham or whatever it might be, 
you have a pretty good s sense of assurance now that you're not going to be the only one there. You're not taking a big risk anymore because other companies are, are all in on that and is the federal government and is the city and state. So how do we do that? What we argue for is an RFP-driven challenge. This could be run by NIST, or we think we love NIST, they used to work at NIST, but you know, any, could be any agency, I guess. We, we, we think, all right, Phil Singerman, who used to be heading up the extra rural programs there, we think NIST is probably the best place to do this. Um, but it would be a, a, a completely independent, objective, RFP-driven process. Congress would set the parameters of who could win, the kinds of places maybe. Uh, cities and regions would then compete. Uh, they would submit proposals. Uh, and the, um, one of the ways to win would be not just that you have enough technology jobs and you're, and you're, you're a promising place. Uh, one of the things would be, do you have real commitment from the state and local level? I, I, I won't say the state, but I recently was talking in one state where the state government had uh, had significantly cut the uh, state technology uh, R&D uh, technology commercialization program, and they were refusing to reinstate the R&D tax credit. That would send a signal, I think, to say, wait a minute, the state is not serious about winning. Now, my other assumption would be if the state were in the competition, you'd have that legislature fix that problem pretty quickly. Uh, a 90-day legislative session would fix both of those so that they could go into a competition and say they want to win. But in other words, cities in the region would have to agree to cooperate, uh, put aside petty differences that many places have. Uh, they'd have to agree to reform institutions, make sure that their community college systems work effectively, that their K-12 through systems are effective, uh, that they embrace smart cities, a whole set of things from the bottom up uh, complemented uh, from the top down. Now, this is a list we had. This is obviously could be more, could be less, but uh, if you just look at some of the criteria we had, there's certainly other cities in there that could be there. One of the ones we had in there, which certainly Congress could decide not to do, which would be having tech hubs that are closer, so uh, certain places uh, are already close to an existing tech hub, but certainly could be changed. So anyway, lots of places could qualify for this. Now, let me just close by saying, what are the objections that, that, you, that some people might make at this? Um, one of the objections is, oh, well, it's fine to do that, but you know, we, look, we really need to put innovation and efficiency and productivity and competitiveness first. Uh, it's nice to think about helping these left behind places and people, but we just can't do that. Uh, look, the reality is this is one of those wonderful, one of, the, one of those wonderful policy areas where we believe you get efficiency and equity together. Why do you get efficiency because, or innovation? As I said before, because now instead of going to Shenzhen or Shanghai, they're coming to Pittsburgh or Birmingham. Uh, and secondly, those places are all struggling, as, as, as Mark said. I was in Silicon Valley recently, and there was uh, going down El Camino, uh, whatever that road is, El Camino in Palo Alto. I see all of these trailer, uh, tr trucks with little trailers on, the, uh, on them, you know, campers. And I'm like, what the heck is that? I said, well, that's where all the software engineers live. So people with a job doing software in Silicon Valley are living in their trucks because of how expensive it is. So this would be helpful not just to the places in the heartland, but to the core hubs. The second argument is, well, federal efforts haven't succeeded. Well, this is simply not true. If, you haven't, if you've read uh, Margaret O'Mara's new book, um, yeah, The Code. The Code. Yeah. Wonderful book, New History of Silicon Valley which builds upon other work, but you see that. The Silicon Valley would still have apricot trees in it if it wasn't for the federal government. There's no question about that. The federal government supported Stanford. It was a big funder of many things. It had R&D labs there. Same thing with Boston. Same thing with Research Triangle Park. So the federal government's have, efforts have succeeded. They can succeed again. The fourth would be only bottom-up works. And, and I think we're, we're, we're sensitive to this point. I mean, clearly the federal government shouldn't say, okay, um, you know, uh, Chicago, if you win, this is the technology we want you to focus on. That's not the job of the federal government. The federal government's job is to enable and allow local places, working with the business community, the civic community, and the government, to identify their own competitive strengths, their own opportunities, and then support that. So this notion that only bottom-up works, I think the reality is what we need is a combination of bottom-up innovation 
bottom-up selection of their own issues and technology areas, but supported by a strong federal role. And lastly, what about left behind places? Um, again, the reality is it, we're just not going to be able to help some of those places through an innovation economy right. lens. You might be able to do through other things, but not through an innovation economy approach. But more importantly, though, if we were to somehow create a you know, fairly vibrant technology hub in a place like Indianapolis, the benefit or, or Columbus, the benefits through local supplier linkages and even, even commuting would extend not just in that metropolitan area, but hundreds of miles around in the hinterland, if you will. This isn't just about helping a particular city. You know, somebody, a reporter asked me that when we were covering the story, and he said, well, look, why would a member of Congress from the rural part of my state be interested in this initiative? And I said, well, the reason is because if you were to win and the major metro hub in your state was, would win, rural parts of your state would do a lot better just because there'd be just so much more economic activity within your state. So I think all four of those objections are easily countered. Um, and with that, uh, we've got a little bit of time. I'm happy to take any comments or questions you might have. That's our contact information, so feel free to get in touch with us. So if you have questions, uh, I don't think we, do we have mics? Great. Um, so uh, I'm going to go right here, and then if you can just say who you are, and then we'll go in order. I see you. Uh, great. It, it, really excellent paper. This is a clarifying question. Um, how did you measure your innovation sector? I mean, you, your, your analysis is based on the MC data. And so uh, that, that, that's a chronic challenge of defining this company or this, this industry. So you can say a bit more about what's the foundation of the analysis? What defines an innovative company versus a non-innovative Can you say company? who you are, Mike, also? I, I'm sorry, Mike Molnar, I'm, I'm with NIST. Yeah, let's see. Uh, this, this is, uh, uh, this is, these analyses are done at the industry level, and we're set there. <laughs> These are industry level analyses, and we're looking at two metrics. We're building on an earlier report we did, an analysis defining advanced industries using cutoffs of R&D expenditure per uh, uh, worker and STEM worker share, so, okay? So then we have tightened those cutoffs to, to focus on the most innovative industries, and so it's a, I'll, I can give you afterwards the numerical cutoff for a quite high R&D uh, uh, concentration in these industries, and a very high, something like 48% of workers in them having a STEM degree. Uh, interestingly, this leaves out uh, one pretty big uh, uh, tech industry, uh, computer systems design, which doesn't actually, though, spend that much on R&D. So we're really trying to get at that innovation crux, that core of creativity. Uh, but, it, but it's done, and this is based, and then the statistics are based on employment uh, trends. Okay. Yes, sir, right here. Yep. Um, I'll go in order, I see him, so here and then here. here. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave Rubin with some retired engineer. Uh, there's a myth that companies go where there are skilled workers. Actually, it's backwards. Skilled workers go where there are jobs if and only if the place is desirable. And that's a question of culture. If the local schools don't teach evolution or downplay it, that's not desirable. If the local medical institutions do not provide full services, including full reproductive services, that's not desirable. They're not going to go there. It's a question of culture. Even in the high-tech hubs, there are lower-class neighborhoods which are not benefiting from this. And that's culturally different. Gentrification is more than a replacement of people. It's primarily a replacement of culture. And when you move high tech into a non-high tech area now, that's a replacement of culture. That's gentrification. And people don't want their culture to change. They want to just keep what they've got and add high tech. And that doesn't work. My question is, why are people not considering this? Because any program that doesn't take this into consideration is going to fail. So I actually think when you look at the literature over the last 20 years in regional science, regional uh, or economic geography, what you find is actually now it's, it's bi-causal. It's, 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 bi it's, it's, the, 
you know, companies go to where skilled workers are, skilled workers go where companies are. So it's, uh, in the old days, it was just people went to where the jobs are. Today, it is both ways. I think your point, I, I wouldn't put your point as harsh as that. I think the reality is that knowledge workers want to go to places that are nice. They, they want to go to places that have good schools. Um, they want to go to places that have sort of an attractive lifestyle. I mean, that's why one of the points we talk about in the report is, is uh, placemaking, cities that make it attractive so you could go to urban markets or walk down by the riverfront. That's what appears that a lot of knowledge workers want. So there's no reason that a place like Indianapolis doesn't have that or couldn't have that. We're, I don't think in a lot of cases we're talking about changing the culture of Indianapolis or Pittsburgh. What we're saying is they've already, you know, again, I could pick 20 or 30 places here. These places have some of that, but they could get more of it. And, and we're talking about a 10-year surge. That's, this will be a transition, right, over time. It's not an, a, a sudden uh, uh, jolt. It is a tr change over time in which places will begin to alter, and likely largely for the best, but there will be tensions, absolutely. Yes, sir. Chris McRae, Norman McRae Foundation. So my father worked at The Economist on how technology would change places all of his life. For example, in 1982, he wrote a survey on why don't we start doing Silicon Valleys everywhere? And what we have learned, because I mean, you know, ever since Moore's Law in the 1965, you've basically had a hundredfold more technology every decade that's what Moore's Law says. Um, what needs to happen if you really want to help develop people is basically to get a G ahead of the next decade. So, you know, the next decade has got, let's say, artificial intelligence, but are we going to humanize that? Or, uh, you know, is artificial intelligence going to sort of take over more and more jobs? Either thing is possible. Uh, the next decade has got 5G, but is 5G going to be something which is only done in football stadiums, which apparently AT&T is, that's all they can do at the moment, or is it going to be, you, you know, widely distributed? So, so I, I, I think your idea is great if you could also project forward the discussion of what, you know, next decade's te technologies are. Uh, but one thing that upsets me about America is that most of the applications of technology don't seem to be to community services like health services or, or, or education. And those are the things which actually could replicate everywhere once you've got a test model working in one city. And I, I, so I'm just wondering if there is a way for your test cities also to share their knowledge, at least on the things that societies need, like health and education for livelihoods. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, the main thing that societies need or the main things that places need, number one, are good jobs. That's it. After that, then you worry about the sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have a good job, if you don't have a vibrant economy, everything else is secondary because you can't afford it. The tax base goes down, people don't have enough money. So it, that's really what this report is about. It's about bringing economic opportunity and high-wage jobs to these places. Um, certainly, there's going to be a technology transformation in the next decade. We wrote a report last year at ITIF called The Task Ahead, Transforming the World with Connectivity, Automation, and Intelligence. And so things like 5G, IoT, AI, robotics, autonomous systems, absolutely. Which is actually the reason why, another compelling reason for this. There's going to be a set of new technologies. For example, smart agriculture. So why couldn't a smart agriculture hub be in Kansas City? Right. Robotics and automation, why couldn't that be in Pittsburgh? I'm just picking up places. So I actually think the opportunities for a more diverse, geographically diverse tech economy are there, and the federal government could get behind that. Yeah, absolutely, and I think, uh, I mean, some, some comment, uh, com comments on this work have suggested that uh, uh, there, you, there could be stipulations of particular zones of research of particular national interest, a kind of mission-driven view. You know, we are silent on that, but it's an interesting idea. But I think, as Rob is suggesting, the, the, all of the proposals would be evaluated on their novelty, their strategic uh, 
uh, cogency, the, the quality of the strategy for development and, and selection of topics. So we think that that would be baked in and we don't want to be front, too front loaded on that. Yep. Right, right. Great. I'm going to go, uh, Rachel, this lady up here had yeah. her hand up first and then I'm going to go back to you and then yeah. I'll go to you. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Li Yang. Uh, I'm thinking of whether you can consider this society should be governed by the manipulation of our government, or we should have a capitalist uh, kind of society that separate the government with the private industry. And if you have a government to subsidize a special industry to create some community, then the employment may not be efficient. Because what I try to say is employment is not really productive job, rather than that just conspire with the private industry and okay. the government. Great, thank you. So, uh, let me just say, so. I didn't quite hear. I think the issue is, is what's the role of the government and the private sector here, and I think our view is generally the role is, a, is private sector obviously has to lead this, uh, but the, there is a role for a partnership, so that's how we frame it. I think the lady back there and then the gentleman right here. Hi, my name is Aya Sarachev. I'm a venture capitalist investor with Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, so we focus on making early stage investments in companies located outside of New York City, Silicon Valley, and Boston. I'm curious about how much you think the federal strategy that you've outlined, or even a state level strategy, should focus on investing in or supporting local venture funds, specifically because many regions either lack local capital from an institutional investor perspective, or they might have angel investors that are looking to back companies, but then there's a gap in seed or Series A funding. So curious about how much you think a government approach can address that. So a, a little bit of what we're proposing here is sort of throw everything at the wall approach. So it has to be research funding, it has to be skilled technical workers, it has to be a good quality of placemaking, uh, it has to be tech transfer, it has to be incentives, but clearly capital, and we talk about that in the full report, that there needs to be a, a vehicle ideally supported by the federal government, perhaps in partnership with the state and local governments, to really enable more uh, deeper and, and more sophisticated venture and early stage capital formation. So we anyway, fully agree with that. Um, I think one of the differentiations of our proposal is a lot of the proposals are, well, we'll have a federal venture program or we'll have this. What we're talking about is putting a lot of those things together in a set of a compelling package that a, a one place could be able to take advantage of uh, so they could, they could really have a robust, really bring their, their entrepreneurial venture level significantly up at the same time, their tech transfer level up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right here, and then right here. Uh, Leo Shvaykovsky's Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, as I'm sure you anticipate, there are a lot of people that think that your, your plan might not have broad enough spillovers and externalities to work out, and that uh, Josh Lerner and Boulevard of Broken Dreams has really shown how, how, how difficult it is to develop new technology-based areas. In that context, have you looked at the Albany Troy area in detail, uh, where which is the closest thing I know of, similar to what you're advocating, where the state of New York has put a lot of money into semiconductors? Has that worked out? And 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 what lessons does that have for your possible proposals uh, to the, uh, to their effectiveness? Sure. So I'll let I mean question? Albany. Yeah. Do you know the Albany? I know the Albany. Yeah. Do you want right. to talk about? Yeah. So let me just Mark. And we both know the Albany yeah. thing, the the, the nano uh, uh, semiconductor thing. But, but let me just mention Josh Lerner's book. If you haven't read it, don't worry. Don't you don't need to read it. Um, <laughs> Josh Lerner's book is. I mean, one of the things he talks about in his book is. Oh, you know, governments. You know, they make these mistakes. And so he talks about this one example where the government created this set of program. I think it's Australia, and uh, and it turns out that you know. Half of these things didn't work, so what did the government do? They modified the program. They tweaked it, and so it started to work again. What did Josh say? Josh, failure. The program's a failure. The first half of the program didn't work. And it was like, tell me a company that gets it right the first time. So Josh Lerner, frankly, is, I, I think he's just overstating that. Sure, there are some really dumb and bad programs. 
you know, there's a bell curve of government intervention, if you will. And, and you, can, you can go into Josh's book and you can find slew after slew of really effective programs. And, and NIST has those, the state of X has those, and the city of Y has those. Those are all around the country. One of the reasons why we haven't been able to, quote, recreate another Silicon Valley is really about this, can we get escape velocity? We can't create another Silicon Valley unless you have real push to get five or 10 or 15 places to be able to do it. Otherwise, everybody's just going a little bit like that. And that's where I would put Albany. And I think, you know, we're, the history of innovation is littered with failures. And it would be unrealistic to assume that every one of these uh, uh, growth centers would be performed to the exactly the same level of success. It's critical to not have zero tolerance for uh, any, any sort of suboptimal outcome. And the problem here is that we haven't tried. I mean, we are, we are trying to argue for scale sufficient scale to, to actually move the, move the dial. We really haven't tried uh, to, to enact this kind of intervention, uh, though we, we say that the, that the history, recent history, is full of efforts. Yes, there are efforts, but they're very small, and we're trying to change the scale. I think there was a question. Yeah, yeah please. Hi, I'm Sunny Glotman with Third Way. Uh, the report is outstanding. One question I have is uh, actually Kauffman Foundation put out a report addressing uh, oh God, it's a play on the st start us up America's business plan. <laughs> and it focuses on growing out on the entrepreneurial e ecosystem in the United States. In this plan, is innovation agnostic as to whether it's with larger pre-established corporations or young businesses? And how do you think that sort of size of firm plays into the equity versus efficiency question? So I would encourage you to not only read, but buy my book. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I really don't care if you read it. Uh, just buying it is the most important thing. Phil, I think, has bought all my books, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. You're, you're who I'm looking for. Uh, in all seriousness, I, I, Mike Lind and I wrote a book last year for MIT Press called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. What it really said was, when you really look at the evidence uh, on innovation, that big firms you know, on average, are just as innovative as innovative small firms. I think we have this sort of small firm idolatry that only small firms are innovative and the only ecosystems are small firm innovation ecosystems. And, and that's just wrong. Uh, you know, go look at Intel or go look at, you know, if you look at the top 10 companies in the world who invest in R&D, you, you've got Google, You've got Amazon, you've got Microsoft. I mean, so big companies play an important role. So, but to be clear, we're also talking about, it goes back to the question from that lady before, uh, e-venture capital. So we're, we're really talking about building ecosystems where you have big firms, mid-sized firms, you have yeah. startups that, that want to get big. Uh, I think, again, we have to do it all. Picking one or the other, I think, is, is, which I know you're not saying, but some people do say that, I think is a big mistake. And, and, the, and, and, the, and the, the, the identified kind of themes or inputs here are some of the crucial core ones, but I think the goal is to create regional, really dynamic ecosystems. But we know some of these elements that are at the heart of those ecosystems, but we're saying we need to really pile on to them and accelerate them and invest in them. You know, so, one of the, you know, I think I don't think we are uh, we're I think we're agnostic about the type of firm in the end that will be driving them. Uh, the crucial thing is that we're really accelerating and expanding the core inputs to an in, to those ecosystems in regions. Yeah, I was just going to say I mean part of this it reminds me of a place that I talked with some leaders there recently, and they were talking about, we, we've got a really good university, and it does a lot of great technology commercialization and entrepreneurship, but then when the firm gets to have 20 workers, yep. the VC says, hey, guess what you're going to? You're going to Boston. And why is that? It's really about, if you will, sort of black holes, gravitational pulls. And I think what we're saying is, that's why a lot of this hasn't worked as much in the past, because you, you can create these innovative things in places, but the black hole, of Seattle or, and I say the black hole in a, not a pejorative sense, but in a just, that's where you need to be. 
And I think if we could sort of change the, the, the gravitational pulls, we, we could have that place become its own place and not, and not have to say, oh, you're not leaving. You want to stay here because it's so dynamic. You know, it goes back to um, this other point. I mean, Mike Molinar leads the manufacturing centers uh, at, at NIST, and, and uh, you know, we've created 15, right? 15. Yeah. 14 now. Yeah, now 14. Right. 15 is about to be announced. Okay, yeah. thank you. So we should, be, have, we should have 45. Uh, that's what we've called for at ITIF five, six years ago. But imagine if we decided to go to 45 and we enable the place like Pittsburgh to say, we're going to be the autom autonomous vehicle system. Uh, yeah. Mike was telling me in China how, they've, how the Chinese have done this. They build these giant ecosystems around these core capabilities. So, again, we could think about that in life sciences in St. Louis for ag biotech. Uh, there's lots of real special areas that could get that gravity. I mean, I'd like to add just yeah. one, one uh, underscoring of the urgency here. This, all of this would have been much easier to do like 20 years ago. Right, would have been easier to do 10 years ago. You know, we're seeing the forces of lock-in intensifying. There's more to push back against, and it's going to take more effort to add to the roster of truly, you know, autonomous places that are at takeoff. So, you know, I I, I think one of Ron's and my message is that this is a big problem, and it's going to take some serious commitment over time, uh, and it may, inc may include a failure or two, but it's going to be a, you know, a need to be a major push because the intensification of the existing hubs has become very, very tough. Uh, go to yep. Phil right. It also is, it would have been easier 10 years ago because the foreign tech competition from tech hubs was a lot less right. back then. Yeah. Those countries have all looked at us, they, yep. they study us, they, 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 hey, we've got our own buy dole, we've got our own. And now they've, they've yep. created real alternatives that are viable for U.S. companies to go mm -hmm. to. And so that's why it's another critical reason. Phil. So Philip Singerman, there's a couple of questions. Could you, not, not you're, you're, it's a fabulous report. And, uh, and I'll read this one. <laughs> Partly because it's free. You read the reports, but not the books. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but I did, but I did read, you know, big and beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, could you could you expand upon your concept of innovation, right? Because just hearing the presentation, one would get the impression that we're dealing with startup nation, right? We're dealing with, you know, high tech startup software and maybe some bio on in, in the coast, but basically it's not in the productive sector and it's startup companies, right? It's not existing companies, but you. I'm sure you mean more than that. So it would be useful to have a, uh, your thoughts, your broader thoughts about, about um, what you think about in terms of the breadth of innovation. Um, the, I'll, and I'll say okay. one thing right off. A actually, the analysis is based, though, on industries. Right. And it's based on, you know, R&D intensive right. industries and and the work and the STEM workers they have. So it's it's not so much based around technology or type of firm. It's based about around the creative, innovative activity. You know, and I, so I think we're sort of agnostic about what type of of industry, uh, what type of innovation we're searching for. But do you, do you, and the second question is: Do you capture a broader definition of manufacturing, not the narrow current definition, but Production, you know, what was typically understood to be the full spectrum of, of, right. of manufacturing from R&D to distribution and sales. Um, does this, does your model encompass that? Do you capture that? Does it build that? Because that's much more dispersed across the country than in these, right. in, the, in, in Boston and, and, and San Francisco. So in, you know, our industry cut includes aerospace and includes uh, you know, uh, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing. Semiconductors. Yeah, semiconductors. So Instrumentation. Again, we were agnostic about, you know, the type of industry, but we were insistent and rigorous about the R&D cutoff and the STEM worker cutoff. So, yeah, yeah I mean, Phil, this, I, this to me would not be, 
you know, a machine tool making widgets. Uh, right. Those are important companies. They're, we need them. We need them to be modern and productive. This is really about a set of companies that require and rely on agglomeration economies. The, the uh, uh, R&D is not quite high enough. Uh, yeah. Auto is not in, but aerospace is. Yeah. So, but again, I think the key this point is for here. for demonstration. The right. key point here is not, again, that we or, or Congress should pick that. It's rather to say a place to say we think we can be a hub. Now, the, the problem with, the problem with um, you know, Cummings is they're in whatever that town is in Indiana. Yeah, small, relatively small place. They're kind of the main deal there. I'm not sure they're going to Columbus, Indiana. We were just visiting there, my colleague. So, but certainly you could imagine a place like Milwaukee, let's say, winning. And they have, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is their big company? The automation um, company. The auto, uh, come on. Right. Rockwell. They have Rockwell. Right. Global lead. You know, that's an innovative company. Uh, they're doing all this R&D. But they have other kinds of things there. So you can imagine... Again, a place like Milwaukee saying, we're going to focus on two or three things. One of them is automation technology. So. But, and, and again, you know, the, all the cutoffs and industry analysis I'm talking about was used to demonstrate a picture of concentration at the industry level and at the employment level. You know, again, that is demonstrating trends at work, but it is not uh, the, the policy proposal is actually fairly agnostic about uh, the nature of the industries, right? Yes, right here. Hello, I'm Lisa Arafna with the uh, Coalition for Academic Scientific Computation. And we have 93 um, ac academic members and they're top tier research institutions sprinkled across the country. And you know, a couple of things come to mind. One of the things is when we, when we uh, plan meetings, we try to have it in place where it's a one-stop one hub. And when, when I uh, was working with Purdue, you know, that was another thing I would hear a lot is that complaints about we can't get the airlines to have a non-stop flight from the really important places where people need to get here. And I saw that you did address that, but would you mind expanding on that and telling us more how you're going to make it happen? So the airline point is a, is a perfect point because it, it demonstrates this notion of cumulative causation. So if you've got a good airline hub, you attract companies, you attract the kinds of companies that want airline hubs, you get more airlines, you get more connections, you get more directs, and then you build more. And so uh, that's sort of the same issue with skilled workers and other things. So I think part of this would be imagine a place they, they win and as part of what they do in their winning bid, the state and the metropolitan region decide they're going to support a significant expansion of the airport, so uh, more, more terminal, more, more slots, et cetera. And then on top of that, you figure some growth starts to happen. They get more airline directs, and grow, more growth happens. And so you would hopefully, through this organic growth, stimulated by the federal government, it would then lead to self-growing, self-sustaining expansion of airline hubs. But your point is right. It's, it's, that's one, another reason why it's hard to imagine small places like Columbus, Indiana, being able to do this because airline hubs are really, really important. And so you need a certain level of size yeah. with a regional airport to be able to make this work. I mean, we debated whether to actually, you know, ent throw them into our potential our list of potential places, we left it out. We actually could imagine that that, be, that could become a central portion of a particular region's strategy and proposal. And part of the complaint was that there were generally accountants that were making the changes to the airline routes. So if, right. if it was a small town and there wasn't enough traffic, they were, canc they were canceling the, the routes that were direct from the small towns yeah. to the bigger towns, and so that was causing problems for people to be able to get to where they need to go. And then in Indianapolis, of course, they expanded the airport tremendously. Right. And I think Alaska Airlines pulled out recently, which has affected me, my ability to go to the West Coast as well. And so that's been extremely inconvenient, but what am I right. supposed to do about that? Yeah. So, I so airline deregulation has been, I think, on net an unalloyed good. We have high productivity, significantly lower price increase. I just did a little piece on this. Um, but one of the challenges of airline deregulation is it allowed the winners to get to be even bigger winners. You had concentration of hubs where you didn't have that before. You had a lot more one-to-one -one shots, and now you're much more hub-and-spoke. And I think this proposal...
proposal would try to push against that in some sense by creating more airline hubs that would be viable. So, any so other uh, last comments I or questions? I think that we think we are probably uh, reaching the end. <laughs> Uh, well, great. So thank you. First of all, thank you so much for your attention. The report yeah. and the executive summary are both on, our, uh, both on the ITIF and the Brookings website. Uh, if you want to follow up with any questions or comments later yeah. to us, either now or by email, uh, please do so. Yeah. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah.